Good morning, everybody. That was an excellent talk that we just saw from Brandon. Happy Friday. Uh, it's been a long conference. Thanks for being here. Friday hug to you all. If, if the house lights were up, I'd take a picture. Yes. The title of this talk is The Rails of JavaScript Won't Be a Framework. And the slightly less provocative version of that title is The Rails of JavaScript Will Be More Than Just a Framework. Um, my name is Justin. Uh, we we're not going to have time for questions afterwards. It's going to be a very, very fast, talky, slide decky thing. Uh, so please tweet me with questions, feedback. Uh, praise is always welcome at Searles. Uh, and critical feedback is always welcome at hello at testdouble.com. This is to talk about three of my favorite things. One is cupcakes. Two is the planet Earth. And three is monolithic application architecture. <laughs> so on cupcakes, say that you own a bakery. And a uh, customer walks in, and they say they want something sweet. So you uh, uh, bake them up a beautiful cupcake. And they say, hey, you know, this is really good, but I like a little bit more uh, sweetness, maybe a little crunch. So you put some sprinkles on top. The customer is like digging the cupcake, but says, you know, on second thought, I really think I want something like with some hot fruit filling. And then you just think to yourself as the baker, ah, oh, god damn it. What they really wanted was a fresh baked pie. So you throw away the cupcake, and you make them a pie. And that's an honest mistake if it happens once. But if your workflow as a baker is to assume everyone needs a cupcake, only to have to inevitably throw it away and then bake something else, that's a real problem you know, for your business. So say you own a software studio, and a customer walks in and says, hey, I need a web application. And so you say, oh, great, what's its name so that I can type Rails new? And uh, you build them a little graph, you know, you render it on the server, and then they say, hey, you know, this graph is great, but I need some zooms and some filters. And so you're like, hey, you know, I, we can do that. Sprinkle some JavaScript on top. And then they say, you know, this is awesome, but let's load all of the data all at once so that we, the user can really, really, like, just see absolutely everything at a glance, really dynamically, like an app, you know? And then you, the developer, are like, ah, god damn it. Because there's no logical path from that solution to what they really wanted, which was a fat client JavaScript application. I mean, Rails is probably still involved providing API services, but it's not the center of the application. That monolithic approach doesn't work. And it's an honest mistake if it happens once. But if part of your workflow is to immediately assume that Rails is the solution to every single web application, and then you only realize later that you've built a gigantic mess with JavaScript, that's a problem. The reason that I think that a lot of Rails developers fall into this trap is that Rails is too convenient. When you're a Ruby developer, you have all these awesome tools right at your disposal. We've got this great convention-based framework, so I can just add a gem, and it may be a couple lines, and then I get all of this great behavior on the cheap. And when we ask Ruby developers about their favorite client-side tools, they usually come up empty. Nobody hates JavaScript more than Rubyists. So they, they, they just can't think of any. And of course, there's not like there's no client-side tools. I'm just kidding. There are plenty of client-side tools available to Rubyists. Um, <laughs> but this is their reputation, right? They're jagged and rusty and terrible. So every time a new story comes down the pike, we have to make a decision, right? Where's the best place for this to live? What's the concern here? If a user brings me a, a user interface card, it might be that the best place to write that, the best place for that to live is in the browser. But the second thing I ask when I get a new card is like, hey, where's, uh, what, what would be the easiest thing for me to actually do to build this? Take the least time, be the quickest to market. And because Rails is so convenient, the answer is often Rails. So even though the best place for the code to live might be the front end, I'm incentivized to start solving client side problems on the server side and take into an extreme that's really unhealthy. So I have a provocative statement to make. Non-Rubyists write better JavaScript. I went to a .NET conference, my first .NET conference last year in Sofia, Bulgaria, and uh, I was blown away by how much we were talking the same language. We were using great, brand new, Node.js-based tooling. Uh, everyone was uh, talking about and excited about Angular, even Ember. Uh, uh, but what uh, my expectations were was it's .NET, this is crusty, you know? And what I found in actually talking to people was, because .NET wasn't so incredibly awesome, they didn't have that same moral hazard. You know, they were willing to solve the problem in the right place. And when I think back at my own experience, before Rails was easy for me, whether that was before 2005 or when I was doing projects in other tech stacks, JavaScript wasn't hard. You know, I actually really quite enjoyed JavaScript until I was told, you know, to hate it. 
And granted, we can have a long discussion. We can have a WAT-like screencast here of what is asking, is JavaScript a terrible language? And I'll just like clear the air, right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I spend most of my time in JavaScript. I agree it is terrible. But I'm careful not to conflate that with, hey, well, is that why writing JavaScript is terrible? The problems I've always had with JavaScript have nothing to do with WAT, have nothing to do with map and parse and fundamental problems with the language, because I'm usually working at a higher level of abstraction. Right? Problems I have with JavaScript are all of the tooling, the ecosystem, the community. So I, I challenge you to ask again later if you think the language is the one at fault. After this talk, hopefully I'll be able to persuade you a little bit. Let's talk about the planet Earth. I love Ruby, and I love Ruby mostly for the community. I love the language, but I love the community because they changed the world when it comes to web application development. If you were to chart all the great new tools for the web that have released over time, starting in 2005, the fantastic gems that were sort of the foundation for, for, for Ruby on Rails in this community, over time, Haml, SAS, all these great extensions, alternate stacks that we can have an omakase and a prime stack, RSpec, Cucumber, these great innovations helping us build better web applications. The world, it, Ruby Gems became this mature marketplace of free stuff that would help us write better code. But then, right around 2012, I started to notice that when a new feature would come out for, like, say, WebKit, it wasn't immediately followed by gems that would exploit it. Instead, I was finding JavaScript tooling written in JavaScript on Node. And that started popping up, and then 2013, it really seemed to take off. And you come to 2014, and a lot of Rubyists, I think, have this latent fear that JavaScript is going to devour planet Earth. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that it probably will. Where are the best tools? If you were to ask yourself this, you can add, a, add up a bunch of fact values. For example, Ruby's tool ecosystem, it's mature, but it's crowded. There's not a lot of room for growth, because everyone already has a lot of tools available that they, that they love. But Node's ecosystem, it's immature, right? It's innovative because so much new stuff gets pushed up, and it's frustrating. But it's great, because as soon as a new feature hits a browser, there's a tool to exploit it. I mean, granted, I get as frustrated as anybody else that when I run npm install on something, like by the time the install finally finishes, at least two of those dependencies have probably had updates pushed. <laughs> but that's the fantastic, that's what I loved about Ruby in 2006 and 2007. And tool authors, they're not immune to trends. I write a lot of like, open source tools, and I want to go where the people are. I want to go where I'm going to have a big impact. And so tool authors are now gravitating to, to, to the world of JavaScript because the universe of people who have to deal with JavaScript is about 7 billion people, and the universe of people who have to deal with Ruby is in the tens of thousands. Yeah, all 7 billion are JavaScript developers. I realize that's flawed. Um, <laughs> also, tools, they address the problems of their day. A gem that was written in 2008 was written to solve problems that person was facing in 2008 not 2014. A tool that was written in 2014 surely must be useful in 2014, and so they're just a better fit for the web as it exists today. You add all that up, and I, you know, I really believe that web tools in Node tend to better solve today's problems. And this is maddening for those who insist on only using Rails for absolutely everything. But hey, speaking of Rails, let's talk about monolithic application architecture. Rails won the war, right, on web application frameworks. It came in with a whole bunch of great reasons that we can go into later about why it was just the best. It was, it was fantastic. And all these frameworks since then have adopted a ton of great ideas from Rails. But what we don't often think about when we consider that phenomenon is to ask ourselves, which war did Rails win? All web applications, like generally? Or is there some subset of applications for the web that are a better fit for Rails than others? DHH last year at RailsCon said that good frameworks are extractions, not inventions, extracted from real applications and not just invented. And so when you look at Rails, you, obviously the story is that the company Basecamp made Basecamp, and they extracted the good bits, the common bits that they were seeing across a lot of their projects into Ruby on Rails. And those kinds of bits that are common to many of us, almost all web applications, URL routing to point you to custom a uh, actions that you write, modeling behavior, of the, of the models in your objects, the validations, and all of that at a fundamental level. Persistence, storing stuff in a database, querying for the stuff, the relationships between stuff. Session management in a, in a way that's abstracted from where the session stuff is stored was hugely convenient, obviously. All those ancillary concerns of the wheels that you don't want to reinvent, like mailers. And then there's this last little bit that's like all these JavaScript alternatives. 
That is sort of like the, the means by which to sprinkle JavaScript on top. Like Ajax ERB tags that dump a whole bunch of JavaScript into your uh, on-click handlers in, in, your, in your markup. Or later on, RJS. Or later on, unobtrusive Ajax ERB tags. Or later on, turbo links, right? It's not that those are bad, that those alternatives are bad tools. It's that they're there to solve, they've been extracted from, an application that just didn't have the problem of trying to solve and, and write JavaScript in the way that I want to write JavaScript. Because if you consider Basecamp, you start at a page. It's a traditional web workflow. You start on a page, you click on a thing, you get another page. You click on a thing, you get another page. It's a, it's a multi-break process. And that represents a huge proportion of the web. And that percentage of the web was almost 100% in 2005, but it's much lower now. If your app isn't a one-to-one -one mapping of like CRUD in a database and you're just exposing that as an interface to the users, if there's any layer of indirection, you, it might not be a good fit. Yesterday, Sandy Metz made the comment as an aside that there are Rails apps and then there are apps that use Rails. I'm finding that more and more the apps that I'm writing are apps that use Rails. I can love Rails and not necessarily take advantage or, or really find a lot of benefit from the front end aspects. So Rails promotes a, an HTML user interface uh, uh, in the front end because that's what Basecamp needed. And what I mean when I say that is stuff like you're writing HTML markup, like I have an anchor tag here with a, with a ref and, and content, or I might have a form action here with uh, you know, an input, submit. And when you're writing HTML like this, it feels like you're making the UI, but you're not writing like UI programming. What this is, is this is the specification of a UI. The user agent, the browser, is the thing responsible for figuring out how to render a link and what to do when you click it. It's how to render a form and what to do and you know, how to paint a button and so forth. It's, you're, not, you're kind of outsourcing the UI programming. If you're building an application with the browser as your runtime, though, I'd call that a JavaScript UI. And fundamentally, the activity is just different and more complex. You know, you're responsible for finding the point in the DOM that you want to render stuff into. Or you're responsible for binding to an event that the user does something, and then you need to take some custom action. You're the one in the driver's seat. They're fundamentally different concerns. But our tools, um, I think, file, I like tree uh, to tree stuff out because I think that tools tend to betray their biases based on the layout of the files that they give us. Uh, you know, a naive Rails app might look like this, and it screams MVC, and it screams server side. Um, but of course, in reality, uh, uh, one of the kind of like you know dustbin corners is that we have this this ghetto right under assets, and then the most you know unfortunately named directory ever. JavaScripts, uh, and then application JS. And it's telling us all this stuff at the top, this matters. And this thing at the bottom, just write one big long bowl of spaghetti, and it'll work out. And that's how a lot of people write you know, JavaScript and Rails applications still. Some people, though, that's not good enough, so they, 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 they realize that they need to write more structured JavaScript. And so we end up with this new thing, like an HTML UI and a, and a JavaScript UI combined. And you might notice a pattern here, right? There is a, a, an MVC in the back. And then it's also MVC in the front. It makes Command T really difficult, but it, uh, you know, we see this duplication of back-end concerns and front-end concerns. And there's also this, this little ne uh, uh, nagging doubt about, do we really need this views here, right? If we're building a full-blown fat client JavaScript application, the back-end views are, uh, that Rails provides just are less useful, so those often get cut out now. And we, we just have sort of a JSON API in Rails, and then this deeply nested JavaScript UI. And so at this point, if you, like a new person comes to your project and they ask, hey, so what exactly is that thing, right? I would call that a vestigial appendage. <laughs> because it can only be explained in terms of the past. You have to pull up your you know, forensics of like, well, in 2008, we were all you know, thinking this, and now it's still like this. What's wrong with that vestigial appendage? Well, what's fundamentally wrong is that uh, a fundamental problem in, in, in programming is that we move way faster when we can fit the whole application in our head at once. And when on day one of any project, you can fit the whole thing in your head at once. But on day 1,000 of the project, that's probably not going to be true. So if you build a monolithic thing up front, as that app gets bigger, eventually you reach a point where you can't fit it all in your head, and you, you start to uh, page, right? You, part of the application that you're working in, you can think of. And then over here, you start to have page out. And if you don't modularize things well, then that, that, that thrashing is really, really risky. Because it might mean that like, I'm in this part of the app, and I just kind of have to hope that my tests are going to cover me. Although by the time you're this big, your tests in a typical Rails app are 10 hours long. So maybe tomorrow you can find out that it worked. Um, but if you, via common concerns, and find a good module point to, to separate on, if you were to identify that you could have like a front-end app and a back-end app, as those two things grew, 
even if the net complexity is higher, at some point, they're not going to fit in your head either. But the paging story is much nicer because they have a clean, well-defined separate contract. So the application uh, the, the, that you're working in, the backend application, if you have to work in it, you can work in it. And then when you page out, it's not thrashing because there's a clear, understood contract between the two. Relatedly, I like to say that late extraction costs more than early abstraction. Yesterday, Sandy's talk was great at telling us about wrong ab abstractions that have been found and refactoring away from those. But when we've seen the same project a dozen different times, I would much rather uh, uh, extract uh, uh, seldom and, and, and abstract early. And that's really confusing sounded, so I'm going to talk about yarn now. Um, imagine you have two balls of yarn. Uh, if you decided, like, man, I really just wish instead of these two ugly balls of yarn, I had a big knot of yarn all tangled together, that's really easy to do, thanks to the basic laws of entropy. But if I have a big, big tangled knot of yarn and I decide that I really would love two nicely balled, you know, nice balls of yarn, turns out that's very, very difficult to do. That doesn't work. So that's why I, what I mean when I say that late extraction, all these like, fancy refactorings that we can do, costs a lot more than just knowing you needed two things in the first place. So back to this, this two-step that I see in a lot of Rails applications where in one project you've got the JSON API, but you also have all the JavaScript. This isn't problematic until you consider this kind of stuff. You, you, you have a template that renders a script tag at the top, and then in the ERB, certain bits of data are kind of taking this sneaky back door instead of actually using the, the proper API to just dump data in that the JavaScript application needs. And when you see this, it really means your yarn is tangled, right? Even though you think you have separate things. And your API is a lie, because it means that even though your application is mostly using that API, if somebody were to come and say, hey, I want to build a mobile app for your site, they're going to have to spend a month figuring out how to get that token, right? But it's hard not to cheat, and I agree. Um, it's very, very difficult, especially given what we talked about earlier, where the, the tooling is so bad. So my objective in the last four years of my, my open source contributions and now at Test Double, uh, where we spend a lot of our time, we want to help make JavaScript apps easy, as easy as Rails. When you think about Rails and the responsibilities of Rails, there's really three distinct parts. We have an application framework, stuff that we extend, action controller and so forth. We have conventions and configurations that are laid out for us that we learn through the community and the documentation. And we have build automation stuff, like, like uh, uh, Rails CLI and Rake. And Rails owns the whole stack. If I had to grade them separately, I'd say that Rails as an application framework, when I first found it, I loved it. But I found on like many year, five year, six year projects, it encourages a lot of things that are problematic. So maybe I'd give that a B minus if I was grading it separately. But the conventions and configurations, that's awesome. I love that I can hit a new Rails Teams project, and because of the tribal knowledge that we have, as well as the conventions laid out and the sensible defaults, I can see how is their app different from the norm really easily. The build automation stuff is pretty good. I think it's gotten a little bit stagnant. Fantastic in 2005, and I haven't seen a lot of really cool stuff lately, but still solid. What I really want to talk about today is convention and configuration and the value that that can bring to our JavaScript tooling. Also keep in mind that a lot of people who are new to Rails or have only ever worked in Rails just see one big thing. They don't see these as separate problems. So if that's you, try to think about these uh, responsibilities separately, because I think they can be solved by separate tools. For example, in JavaScript, application frameworks are everywhere. If I decide I want to solve that middle problem by writing another application framework, then I'd have to you know, go and popularize it against all the other application frameworks. I think that they can be separated. You know, Whether I'm writing Backbone or Angular or Ember, lately I've been writing a lot of Ember, and I love it. But every six months, I keep changing my mind. It's a fact. So, so at this point, I just want to be like, eh, I want to write awesome tools that are framework agnostic that anybody can ex exploit. From the build automation perspective, uh, like I said, the, the community is already in Node.js worldwide. As soon as stuff is happening, great tools are showing up in Node.js first. I just want to be this little guy in the middle, right? I want to be the convention and the configuration. And that's why we built Lineman. Lineman, like a, like a lineman on, on a railroad, uh, is uh, on Twitter here, and you can find his URL. And you install him with NPM. So you have Node.js installed, and you can just say NPM install globally lineman. And you create a new app really easily with the CLI, just like Rails. Lineman new app. So here's me typing in lineman new. Start a new project. And I get a, little, I get a handful of commands that I can run. But first, I'm just going to CD in. I'm going to tree out all of the files that I have. Like I said, it betrays the biases, right? One way to learn the conventions is to see what it generates. 
So you can see I have an app directory with CSS and images and JavaScript, and then pages that render on the back end and templates on the front, a handful of configuration files, a whole bunch of spec helpers to help you test, and then places for all your vendored third-party libraries. And it's convenient, right? It's nice to get that bootstrap for you. But our goal is to make it convenient throughout, to switch between projects, to reduce duplication, to make things more common across all of our work. One aspect of that is our productivity workflow. I want to be able to write some code, save the code, have that code automatically compile for me every time I save, have it concatenate for me every time that I save, and then I want to be able to hit Command R and refresh and play with it. But I want to be able to do all of that in less than 100 milliseconds, because I want a fast feedback loop so that I can keep working quickly. In Lineman, we do this with a command called Lineman Run. So you say Lineman Run, it does a whole bunch of initial uh, build stuff, but then it just starts watching for file changes. So I can hit the server, uh, the dev server. It says, hello world. I'm going to make a quick change, say goodbye world. It's already updated. I refresh the page, and that's that. Now, this is a simple app, but even on large apps, it scales very well. On our largest applications, it's still roughly 100 milliseconds. So this is great. But command R driven development isn't the whole story, right? I also like to write tests, too. Sometimes I'm doing test driven development. When I do, uh, uh, I also want the same story to slot in really nicely with, with tests. And I want the same feedback cycle to be super duper fast. Lineman ships with a cool t a tool called Testum, written by Toby Ho, that's really fantastic. What you do is you open up another shell, a second shell, and you run Lineman spec. And you get this interactive test runner. Launches Chrome here, and uh, uh, here I'm running a test already. Going to just change the uh, spec to say that I'm specifying that that function return goodbye world. Save it off. Got a failure that quickly. I can debug because it's in the browser, but I'm just going to fix it. Save, and I'm up hit. My tests are passing. In addition to the interactive runner, we want a really solid CI story. So you just quit out of Testum with the Q key. And you can type lineman spec CI. And this will going to run it all in PhantomJS with a nice reporter output. And every lineman project generates a Travis YAML file when you lineman new. So you literally just push it to GitHub. And if you use Travis as your CI service, it's a one button thing. And now you have a CI build for your JavaScript, which if we were to ask people to raise hands, I don't think every hand would go up if, if, if I asked if you have one. The deploy story is similarly easy, because since lineman is just a static asset generating tool, can your server host static files? Then yeah, you're good. When you run lineman build, and then you tree out its dist directory, which is where it puts its built artifacts, it looks a little like this out of the box. You have an HTML file that references a CSS file and a JavaScript file, and both of those have already been concatenated and minified for you, and they're ready to deploy. There's a single flag in the config that you can set, and then just like Rails, you get asset fingerprinting. It makes it really nice for deploying when you have a CDN. Everything else that ever is going to end up in your dist directory is going to be stuff that you added, so it'll be stuff that you understand. It's a really easy build story. Pushing to Heroku is also really easy. We host most of our uh, testable stuff on Heroku. So we just set, uh, we wrote a custom build pack. You set that up, and then you say git push. It'll build it with Node.js, but then at runtime, we don't need it, and so it just runs statically without Node. And we also have a whole bunch of starter projects to help get people up and running quickly. Not everyone's just writing vanilla JavaScript, right? We have uh, some people who want to get started with Angular quickly. Uh, Backbone or Ember. You can just clone and go. Clone the project and get started. You'll have a little bit of example code. It's a great way if you want to learn Angular or learn Ember just to clone our, our example project because it'll build right away. Like You already know how to run it. We also have a, a really cool, we, it's because it's so flexible, we also use Lyman to build all of our JavaScript libs that, libs that we uh, uh, maintain, as well as our blog. And, and you're free to use Lyman, of course, to, to write a Markdown blog. It's really, really convenient. So back to planet Earth. We're using Grunt. We, Grunt is a, a, is a build tool n descended from you know, a whole bunch of other build tools uh, that, that is used for task definition. There's a, lot of different, there's a lot of competition here right now in Node.js. A lot of people are using Gulp. A thing called Broccoli came out recently. It's really cool. Um, but what we use Grunt for primarily is a place to get awesome stuff from the community. All these tasks ship with Lyman out of the box. Or are, and, and so many more are available. We really, really love that we're able to so easily pull in uh, a new behavior through Grunt in a consistent manner. Lyman itself <laughs> is comically extensible. We have a plugin system that's built a little bit around this um, uh, a mental model we'll talk about in a second, but it's really easy from a user's perspective. All you do is save it. 
npm install, and then you save the, save, uh, the dependency, run like Lyman Bower. When you do that, after you run Lyman run, the next time after you save that, Lyman will pick it up from your package JSON, know that it needs to load it, and Bower will be slotted in at the appropriate step in your build's workflow. No more configuration. It even generates your Bower JSON for you if it's not there. Because deep down, there is an NPM module out there, Bower, right, published by Twitter. Um, and around it is a, a, a grunt Bower task that somebody in the community published. And then at the top, we have this Lyman Bower plugin that we maintain. Bower is the thing that actually does the thing. That's where most of the hard work is. This, this Bower task here uh, from Grunt, it automates the thing. There's a lot of hard work there, too. What Lyman does is it just knows, given Lyman's conventions, how to configure the thing for you. And so we have this kind of boxed approach to, to how we conceptualize plugins. So you, in your application, you might have a Lyman Bower plugin that you use, but you can also have a Lyman Ember plugin that's going to handle all your templates uh, the way that Ember li likes to see it. And recently, we, uh, we learned and we were really excited that Rackspace is adopting Lineman for its front-end development. Uh, and I encouraged them to write a meta plugin, because you can have recursively, arbitrarily many plugins down the line. So this plugin here, you name it whatever you want, maybe your company's stack or something, it can bundle as many plugins at the appropriate versions that you want, but you can also override any of the configurations of those plugins and get them just how you like. That way you don't have all this duplicated configuration across all of your team's files, team's projects. Back to monolithic application architecture, I've painted a picture where we can separate into two things, but I want to talk a little bit more about the benefits of doing that. So say that you have a client and a server. One of the first questions that comes up is like, hey, well, how am I going to run uh, stuff in development, but it still needs to see the server? I'm not going to build all these extra stubs for my server side. Uh, and we agree that would be really onerous. So we built a feature into Lineman that we call API proxying. Basically, think of the browser hitting Lineman, uh, and maybe we'll have a Sinatra in the back end. Uh, uh, the browser is only going to know about Lineman. It's going to make all of its requests to Lineman. But whenever they ask for any API routes that Lineman doesn't know how to respond to, we've got it configured to call back to Sinatra. Sinatra responds, and then Lineman proxies that request back to the browser. So it's a seamless environment. It's as if you're developing in one thing at runtime, even though the code has all the benefits of, of, of physical separation. It looks a little bit like this. So here I'm going to uncomment a little bit of configuration that we give you, change the port to 4567 for Sinatra. My application's real simple. It's just got a simple route high. It gets it, and then it paints it onto the screen, whatever the text is. And then my Sinatra app just returns iHeartRuby at that particular route. So when I write Lyman run, you can see it said it's proxying. I'm going to look at Sinatra's logs. I refresh, and it got the request from Lyman, and it re returned through the browser. Super easy. Now, there's other cases, too, because the benefit of, of separating front end and back end, a big part of that story is that now development of those two things doesn't have to run in lockstep, right? We can make a little bit of extra progress in the front end, maybe do some prototyping. We can have a separate back end team uh, after we get big. Um, but a lot of times we had, like, you know, it would be handy to be able to stub stuff out that doesn't actually exist on the server yet so we can get faster feedback cycles while we're developing our front end. And we offer this in alignment with a tool that we called API stubbing. So, same situation, we have a browser and it's going to be hitting Lineman. And instead of actually phoning through to Sinatra, we're going to kind of stub out a particular route and prevent uh, Sinatra from getting it. And we're going to return that stub back to the browser. So same, same exact code base. We're going to go into config slash server.js. This is a, uh, an express application that's just kind of bundled in. We can define any route we like. We're going to overwrite that high route. And we're going to, we're going to troll our coworkers here by sending that we heart node even more sacrilege. So run lineman, refresh the page, and now our stubbing is in place. You can build entire toy applications inside of that express application. We've had clients in the past, Test Stubble is an agency, and so we're, we're, as consultants, we've had clients in the past who've asked us, hey, just give us a specification of the services that you want. And our specification is a living document of, well, just make it do this. And it's been a really, really seamless, it's certainly better than uh, uh, traditional documentation. Another case that I like a lot is uh, I had a project once with a 30 minute long test build, and I split it up into, I split the application up into two, a front end and a back end, just like we're talking about. Then I went to recover that new application with tests, and I found that uh, the front end tests had a runtime of only four minutes. That made me very worried about the state of affairs in the back end. I figured that might mean that the 26 minutes was hiding there somewhere. But as it turns out, I wrote that, and that only took four minutes too. 
So then I got really suspicious, and I'm like, I should probably have some smoke tests that make sure that when this is all plugged, into, plugged together correctly, it works. And the smoke test, of course, when you plug in them both, it's a little bit slower, and that ran in a whole two minutes. So this 30-minute test suite somehow got reduced to a 10-minute build, even though the, net, the logical and physical complexity of the system increased. And if you understand how build duration tends to grow super linearly, any savings that you can get up front in the beginning are going to mean a big difference. You're going to get a lot longer uh, uh, runway and traction out of that build suite in the far future. And additionally, it's habit forming, right? I mean, having a, a, there's a lot of operational problems that you have to solve when you have two different things to maintain and manage and version as a deploy story, two different projects. You can make it simple, but I mean, once you've solved that problem uh, uh, once, you can have arbitrarily many microservices popping up. Uh, uh, and if you're viewing the world as going in that direction, it's a great problem to solve now with a problem that you already understand really well, front ends and back ends. Additionally, this is not a front end versus Rails talk. It's an and. We love Rails. We use Rails all the time for our services. And Lyman and Rails play together really nicely. Uh, we've got a gem called Rails Lyman and a Lyman plugin called Lyman Rails. You install both those things and you just magically, everything gets auto-configured. And, and your development story is great. And assets pre-compile is just wrapped with a Lyman build first. You can learn more about that at lymanjs.com slash rails.html. And uh, we have this fantastic little uh, documentation site put together for us by Derek Briggs from Neo. More recently, uh, you can actually see me do this myself, uh, live coding unedited, in an Ember screencast that I did, how to get set up like we would set up a project. Uh, and that's at our blog. It's the current most recent article. So just hit the blog.testdouble.com and you'll see the, uh, the embedded screencast. It's a fantastic tool. We love working with it. I also, real quickly, I just want to thank uh, my friend, uh, Marissa Heil. She's a visual designer who's available for contract. She did all of the good illustrations in this talk. Um, and, and, you know, we'd love to help you. If these are problems that are, that, are, that are new and hard for your team, let us know. You know, we are consultants and we'd love to, like, engage with your company and, and, and work on great stuff alongside you. But we'd also just love to answer your questions because I think we want to all make an impact and move the, move the conversation forward. Also, like everyone else at RailsConf, we are hiring. Uh, uh, just send an email to join at testable.com and we'll respond to you promptly and have, start the conversation. Also, um, a couple of my uh, uh, fellow uh, double agents, uh, Todd Kaufman and Zach Briggs, are giving a, a workshop this afternoon on JavaScript testing. I think they'll probably be using Lyman, so it might be a good place to practice both of those things. And I want to thank you. Um, you know, please reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, it was an absolute honor and a privilege to get to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you.